Hello, hello! Welcome to day three of Solilla Week. Today we are talking about the rogue and peasant slave speech from Act 3, Scene 1. Hopefully you know the deal by now. If not, you can check out the links in the description for a playlist to the rest of the videos in this series, as well as the Google Doc, which has all of the soliloquies written out in prose form that will be helpful. Also, apologies for any background noise. My cat has just had an unreasonable amount of catnip, so you may get meowing or scuffles with boxes. But on to the meat of the matter. Today we are looking at the longest soliloquy in Hamlet, at least I think. I didn't feel like counting the lines, but this one feels pretty long. It's nearly 60 lines. Hamlet's final soliloquy might be longer than this. Oh heck, I'll go check. I'll do research. It is longer than how all occasions do inform against me. My instincts did me well. So for the context, this soliloquy occurs at the very end of Act 2 in its second scene. Um, Act 2, Scene 2 has quite a lot of stuff going on. It opened with the King and Queen welcoming Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to the court and implying that they should keep an eye on Hamlet, if you know what I mean. Then we get to see Hamlet and his antic disposition, and he has a comic scene with Polonius. He then has a conversation with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, we will discuss in the main video at what point he becomes suspicious of their presence at Elsinore. During that conversation, Hamlet has what is probably his most famous non-soliloquy monologue, which is the what a piece of work is man speech, but since it's not a soliloquy, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and then uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern inform Hamlet that they met with some players on the road who are coming to the castle. Hamlet is excited about this, then the players show up. Hamlet, clearly a connoisseur of theater, asks the, one of the players to perform a speech about the Trojan War that Hamlet remembers him performing. He gets the speech about the Trojan War, um, and then Polonius is uh, awkward and interrupts the speech, and finally everyone leaves and Hamlet gets to soliloquize for a bit. Nobody saw that I just spit all over my face. So now to read it with an emphasis on where the breaks in ideas are, as we do with the first reading in all of these videos. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing? For Hecuba? What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do, had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears, and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy-metalled rascal, peak like John a dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this? Ha! Huh. Zwoons, I should take it. For it cannot be but I am pigeon-livered, and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's offal. Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. O oh, vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab, a scullion. Fie upon foe. About my brain. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting in a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions, for murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. 
I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. So if we're looking at the soliloquies as a progression for Hamlet's character, we can see that we've finally gotten somewhere by this third soliloquy, whereas the first two had a lot of similarities. Um, so we do still have these unconnected interjections, but we do have longer passages of coherency. Though do note that most of the longer sections um, before the line about my brain contain a lot of repetition. So we're getting that thought process as speech coming through again, as we expect with Shakespeare's great soliloquy writing. When you're thinking about something, there's generally not one specific image that suits it best. There's generally multiple images that sort of blend together to best convey your thought. And this soliloquy is kind of almost like two soliloquies. We've got two quite separate things happening, one in the first two thirds and then another thing in the final third. So the first two thirds are this very emotional thing. He's got a lot of self-hatred going on. Um, but then in the final third, he's constructing a plan. And so the structure changes. We get um, much longer sections of coherency with shorter, um, or in fact, no um, interjections. So let's take a look at it line by line. We start with the line, now I am alone, which is actually finishing out the meter from the previous line. And this is in many cases not considered to be part of the soliloquy. Okay, now we have, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. This is the point where I have to explain to you that Hamlet is very classist. I'm sorry if you love Hamlet and he is your favorite character. He is classist and also pretty sexist. We'll get to that in the main video for the play. Um, but in multiple, on multiple occasions on the speech, he's going to refer to poor people or servants as people who are not capable of having complex feelings. The grammar of this specific line is slightly up for debate because rogue can be interpreted uh, either as a noun or an adjective. So he could be saying, what a rogue am I? and what a peasant slave am I, or what a rogue and peasant slave am I. In any case, rogue, peasant, and slave are all people who are sort of outcasts and not um, supported by the system man, uh, and this is what he thinks of when he thinks of someone who doesn't have a complex inner life, who is able to get shit done. Let's move on from that. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit? Conceit here means imagination. If I was asked to translate this into modern English, I might use the word conception. They're from the same root. So the player, when he was performing this speech from another play, was able to project his soul into his imagination. Uh, that from her working, her is the soul here, so from the actions of the soul, all his visage wand, which means his face grew pale, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, meaning like a frantic or bordering on mad um, countenance, uh, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit. Function is generally referring to the actions of his body. Um, and all for nothing. Well, okay, maybe not for nothing, it's for Hecuba, or even possibly Hecuba. The speech that the player performed was about the sack of Troy, where Hecuba learns that her husband Priam is dead. Priam was the king of Troy, Hecuba the queen, and she is incredibly distraught by this. And the speech is a description of the distraughtness of Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? I think it's interesting that Hamlet uses the word weep here. In the previous section, he had said the actor had tears in his eyes. So, you know, a little bit of crying. And now we moved on to he was weeping for Hecuba. Um, this could be inconsequential, 
but it's Shakespeare. It's not any Shakespeare, it's Hamlet. Let's spill every ink bottle we have, analyzing every single word. Um, so I think it's interesting that we get a, an intensification, which depending on how the player wanted to play that scene, um, could be uh, Hamlet hyperbolizing what the player had did had done. Um, sort of making the player seem like he was more emotionally affected in comparison with Hamlet, who is not emotionally affected by the real things that he is experiencing. Which Hamlet then explains to us, what would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? Cue here is an interesting word because it has theatrical connotations. You know, people say, when is my cue? And Hamlet is using this theatrical language to apply both to what the player has done and to his own life. Then talking about the player again, he would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear, meaning cut open the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free. Um, since free is being paired with guilty here, we can understand free to mean free of guilt. Uh, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. So to summarize what we have so far, this actor was able to cause all of these physical actions purely out of his imagination, out of no actual cause that affects him in the real world. And now Hamlet compares himself to this player. Yet I, a dull and muddy-metalled rascal, dull and muddy-metalled both meaning unintelligence, peak like John a dreams. John a dreams is um, just sort of a way of saying a person who is dreamy or like not really with it. You get this kind of structure in English even as late as Jane Austen's time, but it's not really common now, um, where if you want to describe either a, a sort of archetype of a person or if you want to describe a person that you don't actually know who they are, um, you can pick a very generic name like John for men or Mary for uh, women um, and then use as their last name whatever this attribute that you are referring to. Um, so I believe Mrs. Norris in Mansfield Park at some point is referring to one of the grooms of Mansfield Park but she either doesn't know his name or wants to pretend that she does not know his name because why would I know anything about the servants? Um, she calls him John Groom and we are not meant to understand that this is a man whose actual first name is John and his actual last name is Groom. Groom is his job title and she's sort of condescending to him by not even by making up a name, by picking her own name for him. Um, so Hamlet is peeking like John dreams, unpregnant of my cause, he is not filled up with his cause, which is to murder his uncle, um, and can say nothing, no, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. I think it's kind of interesting, or kind of nice maybe, that we get this most dear life referred to again, um, saying that like, I really loved my dad, guys, because we got a lot of that when we first met Hamlet, but since we see the ghost, Hamlet's affection for his dad has kind of been um, subsumed under his anger for his uncle, which is like, a manifestation of his love for his father, but a less nice one than just hearing that, you know, he really cares about his dad. Then we have mm, this really interesting, juicy part. Um, Hamlet asks himself, am I a coward? Now you could take this as the main crux of the main question of the play. Is Hamlet a coward? That's certainly an appropriate question to ask and potentially answer with your production of Hamlet. Um, there are of course many others, but this one is totally valid. Um, and now sort of expanding on the concept of whether or not Hamlet is a coward. Um, and it's also not totally clear to what extent Hamlet is asking this rhetorically. Is he saying, you know, am I a coward? Obviously the answer is yes. Or he could be thinking, which would possibly make more sense with the style of the soliloquies as reflecting thought. Um, it's like, wait, given all of these things I just said, does that mean that I, does that mean that I'm a coward? But to expand on that, who calls me villain? Um, villain nowadays means like evil person. However, it used to just mean poor person. Interesting how that meaning has evolved. Um, so who calls me villain? Poor person. Oh, uh, and, you know, based on what I said earlier, this also means, like, person who doesn't have convictions. 
um, because poor people don't have convictions. They're too, they're too poor. Um, breaks my pate across, meaning whacks me on the head. Uh, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face. This is a specific Elizabethan insult for people that you consider to be like cowardly or um, traitorous. Regan does this to Gloucester in the blinding scene of King Lear. Um, tweaks me by the nose. Another thing you would do to someone who's a coward, you know, if you come up to someone and tweak their nose, um, you'd only do that if you didn't think they were gonna fight back. So by doing that to someone, you're saying, I don't think you're gonna fight back. I think you're a coward gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs. So basically lies in my face like so bad. And then to sum all of that up, he says, who does me this? Ha, zwoons, I should take it. Zwoons is a contraction of Christ's wounds, which is a sort of curse word um, in ye old Elizabethan times. Um, it's sort of contracted mostly to remove the word Christ because then you are taking the Lord's name in vain, and apparently he doesn't like that. Um, so he's saying, yes, I should let people do all of these things that are done to cowards. I should let them do them to me, because I am a coward. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered, and lack gall to make oppression bitter. To make oppression bitter means to make me feel the bitterness of oppression. I think we are supposed to embrace the um, double meaning that bitter has, meaning like, you know, bad in the situational sense, but also an unpleasant taste because gall is also like a digestive function. I don't know, it's some sort of body thing. Or, ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's offal. Uh, kites are vultures, so he's saying I should have fed this slave's offal to all of the kites the vultures in Denmark. And here, the slave is definitely not himself. Um, Elizabethans would have considered suicide as a cowardly act for the most part. Um, and so he's not saying, you know, if I were brave, then I would kill myself. Um, he's talking about someone else. And who does Hamlet like to talk about without mentioning them by name? You're right, his uncle. We are gonna move on to him now and just have one of the famous unconnected interjections. Buddy body, uh, bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. It wouldn't be a soliloquy from Hamlet if he didn't just yell at Claudius incoherently for a bit. And he comes out with, oh, vengeance. And then he stops and has to consider what he's doing. Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father, murdered, blah, blah, blah. So this that he's referring to is all of this like yelling and waving his arms about um, that he's doing. He had just been saying that he was too cowardly to act. And now here he is not acting. He's just talking. So he says, I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words. So saying, I am not unpacking my heart by taking action that would actually you know, do something to better the situation. I'm just talking and fall a cursing, you know, saying curses, like zwoons perhaps, like a very drab, a scullion. Drabs and scullions are both words for servants and they're quite low ranking serv servants. Okay, so he's really mad about himself for doing this. He just said he wasn't going to, and now he's doing it again. He says, fie upon foe. Ugh, I'm mad at myself. And then he says, about my brain. And by about, he means sort of go about and come up with ideas. So I want to stop talking. I want to start acting. What can I do? Um, and then there's probably another pause as he comes up with his idea. And then we get a much more coherent, straightforward plan. Here you go, Hamlet, you can do it. So I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been so struck to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions, announced their wrongdoings. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. And here is where I have to make a confession, which is that I do not understand that line. I understand so much of this play, guys, but I don't actually know what this most miraculous organ that murder is actually speaking with is. It might just be like the face. He's saying like, if you're a murderer, it's impossible to keep a poker face. 
That's the best I got. If you know the answer, please let me know. Um, I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tense him to the quick. Um, tent means like probe, like it was, a, it was a medical thing involving veins, which I won't describe because it was gross. Um, I'll tense him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. Um, I always interpreted blench to be like some sort of odd past tense or future tense. In this case, actually present tense um, of the word blanch, meaning like grow pale. Um, uh, Yale Shakespeare informs me that blench means move. So if, if he gives some sign, uh, then I know my course. And at this point, it's getting kind of dark, so I'm going to turn the light on. Please excuse me. Whew, been going at this for a while. Okay. Um, we are almost done. Uh, uh, ooh, and now another super yummy part. Ah, soliloquy is so many yummy bits, guys. This is my second favorite soliloquy. There is one that I like even more than it. On some days. Some days this is my favorite. Um, so. Uh, the spirit I have seen may be the devil. And the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, as he is very, you know, persuasive with people who are sad, uh, abuses me to damn me. Now, I think this is a super yummy sentence because um, it can be interpreted in two different ways. You can play it as an actor in one of two different ways, um, which totally changes the entire play and the entire character of Hamlet. So the way that this speech, oops, is normally performed, that this sentence is normally performed, is genuinely Hamlet saying, you know, it, it could be that Horatio and the guards back there who were saying, you know, don't trust the ghost, were right, and that I cannot trust this ghost. Uh, and so I need some sort of additional evidence. And this is how I'm going to get it. The other way you can interpret it is that Hamlet already believes the ghost, but he's afraid of taking action. And so this is sort of an excuse that he is giving to himself. He is continuing to talk and not take action. He's, con he's found a new way to postpone having to murder Claudius. Like, oh, I have to wait until after the play. I have to check to see if he does anything. Maybe hoping that Claudius doesn't do anything so he doesn't have to murder him. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's good. Uh, so when I read the whole speech, I am going to read it with that interpretation because I think that's less commonly performed and I think you should see it at some point in your life. Um, so then he finishes up with, I'll have grounds more relative than this, meaning more, you know, firm than this. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Gotta end the act out with a nice couplet. So I think we really went on a journey there with Hamlet. This, this speech has a whole arc to it. And you know, if this were a lesser play, this idea would be the whole play. Like you could turn this into a whole play by itself, but it's only like 1% of the play. Oh my God, this play is long. I checked once guys, I think Hamlet, the character, speaks more lines than are in the entirety of the Comedy of Errors. It's a long play. Okay, let us do the speech with all of the meaning that we have absorbed previously. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do? Had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have, he would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like John a dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing, 
No, not for a king upon whose life and most upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this? Huh? Zwoons. I should take it. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful, bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance. <sighs> Why, what an ass am I. This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a scullion, fie upon foe, about my brains. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play, have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If he do blench, I know my course. The spirit I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Okay, normally this is where I would say goodbye, but guys, reading this, I just noticed another connection, which is great. Ah, uh, you can never read Hamlet enough times. Keep doing it over and over again. So Hamlet is saying that he's heard that um, people who observe their crimes put on the stage will have this physical reaction. When earlier, Hamlet was saying, I have these really tense emotions, and yet I have no physical reaction. It is a bit strange that he's expecting Claudius to do that. Fortunately, he does, and so the plot is able to move forward. Okay, I don't know if you can tell, but my voice is killing me. So I'm gonna sign off for now. I'll see you guys tomorrow. And I think you all know what we'll be doing tomorrow. The big one. See you then.